Hi everybody, it's Amory and I am on a roll today with recording videos because I'm looking ahead. We only have a few weeks left in the summer term and I wanted to get some materials up on Blackboard for you to reference as we move into postmodernism. So I want to give you a very quick and dirty overview of postmodernism just so that you can kind of understand better the time period, why it came about and what its major tenets or beliefs are, if you will. So postmodernism is the movement after modernism, which was from the First World War till the Second World War. And postmodernism occurs and is also called post-industrialism or the late capitalist age. And as you see on this sheet, it's from World War II to the 70s. If you think about when we had a lot of the countercultural movements of the late 60s, early 70s, uh, it's the sandwich generation between there. And also think about the fact that we had just had two huge world wars in the 20th century. And we had new capabilities of nuclear power, nuclear war, with the button we could demolish each other. We had more advances in technology, including medicine and how we treated people with illnesses, as well as communication. We went from telegrams in the late 19th century to uh, silent movies and radio to now we had uh, TVs in everybody's home, or almost everybody's home. So we had a way to re reach match mass audiences and to communicate that way. And if you think about how much that must have played on the minds of people living from, let's say, the Depression era to the 1960s, that's a lot of advancement. I, I wish that I had interviewed my now departed grandmother about living through those time periods because that's a lot of change to happen in someone's lifetime. So I want to talk to you a little bit more about what postmodernism is about. Also giving you the caveat that the definition for this is fluid as the theory is and that you will find different ideas or notions of this elsewhere. But for my understanding and how I think we can apply it to literature, these are the ones that I want to focus on. So some of these are pretty heavy, or pretty heady, I should say, and, and if you think too deeply and too longly about them, your head starts to hurt. So I want to just brush through them. What postmodernism is first based on is the fact that because of all this tumultuous change and war and the ability to, again, destroy each other with nuclear war, um, we don't have any longer a source of knowledge or truth. There is no one system or place or religion for postmodernists where people could go to find the truth. And up until this point, we had had a pretty strong social norm system of you behave this way because your religion tells you to do this or your society tells you to do this. And obviously we still re live within some of those structures of society. But the postmodernists were starting to push against that. They're like, okay, look at where we're at as a human species. Look at what we've become and what we're capable of. Is there any real truth or is there any real place where we can look at to say this is right and this is wrong? And they would argue no. And part of that is based on the notion that language that we have created over time and have constructed to make meaning of things is fluid. It changes. And so meanings and truth can change. Just think about that. Think about the words that we use to describe our thoughts and our actions and the things we use in our daily lives. We've made all of that up over the course of uh, decades and centuries of human beings being alive. But where does that come from and how does it change? We know every year that words are added and taken out of the dictionary. We as a people create meaning and so there is no one stable place to find that meaning. Because of that, we can never know deeply how someone else lives, um, especially people in the past or people that we've never met. We can only know the surface level uh, because again we are only able to see that. We are only able to know that and words are incapable of showing deep feeling, if you will. Um, they also, though, which is kind of ironic since they seem so grim and dim about a lot of this stuff, is that play can be fun and they can you can play with form. You don't have to stick to this rigid notion of what is good or great. You can play with art and form. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't necessarily have to make sense. It doesn't have to be linear. Play can be good. And because of that, because it, because it pushes the boundaries of normality or regularity or tradition, 
it means that it's trying to subvert these, these methods that we've used traditionally to keep people in place, to keep people in line. And as you see on number 14 here, postmodernism believes in liberation of totalitarian ideas and authorities. Uh, sometimes people will blame postmodernists for being uber left, thinking that they want this kind of form of anarchy where everything, uh, we throw everything out. But really they are trying to expose some of these binaries that we under, exist under, the fact that there are still power systems and structures and expectations. And by creating art in a different fashion than what we've known, we can try to subvert those, those norms and those power structures. As I talked about a little bit with number four, language constructs an illusion of truth, but we can never truly see the past reality. So even though we're reading the works of uh, the Harlem Renaissance and we're reading the accounts of these people who lived through it, we weren't there. We don't know what it felt like. We don't know what the air smelled like in Harlem. Um, this is just a, a representation and only a, a fragment of that representation of what it was like. Sadly, that's probably true. We can't really know what it was like, but this is the best way that we can access it at this point. They also believe that narratives are important. Uh, some of the more traditional literature isn't necessarily narrative, and a narrative is a story that we tell as people to make sense of what it means to be a human being. And some of the traditional works of literature, especially poetry, is, you know, an ode to a vase or understanding mythology. And, and, and postmodernists are like, what we do as humans is important. How we interact with each other is important. We need to record these stories. We need to tell these stories. At the same time, holding this in one hand and this in the other, meaning is unstable. Again, because we use language, because we use words and we construct all of these things, truth and meaning, it's, it's fluid, it changes. And that's uncomfortable for a lot of people. Postmodernism, deconstruction, um, make people feel icky because it, it asks us to throw away what we thought was right, what we thought was wrong, and to reconsider why we think those things and the words that we use to define our systems. And that can be really uncomfortable for a lot of people. Um, as you see in 13, confusion is good. All knowing is bad. So if you've ever met somebody who, I absolutely believe this, I'm right, I know I'm right, I base it on my own experience and my own uh, opinion, and I'm not going to be swayed. Well, postmodernists are saying, that's, that's not right because no one meaning can ever stay constant. What we know to be true now could not be true in 50 years. So they're very much into the school of thinking that, don't be so sure of yourself, I guess. Um, and I have found that this is true. The more educated I get, the more classes I take, the more research I do, the more I write, that what I thought I knew as a younger person and what I thought was yes, no, right, wrong, good, bad, that can change depending on circumstance. And I think as people mostly in the social work program, you will definitely come across that notion. They also remove the idea of the artist as the genius or the magnificent or the wonderful. This notion from romanticism that people who make art are to be admired and wonderful and there's something they've been imbued by the gods with this special ability. Post-modernists post are like, nah, everybody can make art. It, it, you're not special. <laughs> and then um, I like the fact too that they started to question that boundary we have between highbrow and lowbrow or uh, high art and low art. Because in order to uh, understand high art, you have to have a certain education level. And low art is more uh, consumed by the masses. It's more popular that, that therefore that makes it low and less worthy. And they say, no, that's not necessarily true. Let's blow that idea up. They also work for the removal of genres. So we don't need to have the Renaissance movement. We don't need to have the Gothic movement. We don't need to have uh, the feminist movement, everything. We're, we're, just, we're just writing our narratives. We're just telling our stories, which also led to the exposure of the canon. I've touched briefly on that, how it was traditionally dead white guys who were heterosexual. This says, uh, we don't have to do that. We don't have to follow those rules. We don't have to do it just because we've done it. Let's start thinking about writing about new stories, new voices. And that art is an artifice. Um, up until this point, we had praised art that could sublimely and particularly reflect the trueness of an object that we looked at. And then we had Cubism and Pablo Picasso and all these people who were blowing up art and what it meant to be an artist. And postmodernism is like, yeah, let's do that. It doesn't mean just because you can paint a perfect toad over here that the toad has to be a literal representation of a toad. It can look completely different. So I think I'm going to run out of time on my video, but wanted to give you this quick overview. I'll post this on Blackboard. Thanks for listening. Questions, let me know.